some people take Pullman's golden compass to be anti-Christian, to be simply opposed to organized Christianity. And I don't want to deny that that is there somewhere, but that is too simple a way to understand this book. It is slightly more sophisticated, as I said in a previous video, to view this as a kind of passionate argument with a particular all too organized Christian with the genre writer, Christian polemicist, and Milton scholar C.S. Lewis. I would like to suggest to you that this is not a, a book about a simple opposition between two different ideas, but a trinity, as you will, a triangular argument between three different writers, all of whom have very different positions. Um, this is actually not simply Pullman's dispute with Christianity writ large, or even just with Lewis, but his intervention in a triangular dispute between himself, Lewis, and John Milton, from whom both he and who and the most important epic poet in English, the most important poet who in a playwright, um, and someone who is a clear, direct influence on both Lewis and Pullman. Who is John Milton? Those of you who haven't taken Britlet One, those of you who have taken Britlet One, hello, Jose. You might remember this book. It's John Milton's Paradise Lost. It is a 12-book epic poem about, first, the fall of the rebel angels from heaven um, <clears throat> after the war against God, um, with Satan as a kind of epic hero, except that. And of course, Satan's temptation of Adam and Eve were then expelled from the garden. The folks here with vegetation as a belt are Adam and Eve, and they have, um, they, they're getting a timeout for um, millennia. They're being kicked out of the Garden of Eden by an angel here. Lewis, Lewis actually rewrites Book Nine of Paradise Lost in his science fiction work, Paralandra. I will come back to that. He writes a book on Paradise Lost. He is a Paradise Lost scholar. And of course, he's author of the Narnia books. This trilogy, His Dark Materials, takes its name from book two of Paradise Lost. His Dark Materials is a quotation from Paradise Lost. Your novel, if you didn't notice, starts with a quotation from Paradise Lost. It's okay, right there. Into this wild abyss, the womb of nature, and perhaps her grave, of neither sea, nor shore, or, nor air, nor fire, but all these in their pregnant causes mixed confusedly, and which thus must ever fight, unless the Almighty Maker them ordain his dark materials to create more worlds. Into this wild abyss the wary fiend stood on the brink of hell and looked a while, pondering his voyage. <clears throat> the wary fiend there is Satan, who is trying to bust out of hell in Book Two of Paris Lost. He's come to chaos, which is a sea of just primordial mess. And here you see him stopping and pausing before he makes that transition between worlds. If you've gotten to the end of the novel, you understand about that pause before you cross a barrier from one world to another. You also have Satan here as an anti-hero, I would suggest that Azrael is a satanic figure in some ways. There's an ongoing debate in English studies for 300 years since the Romantics, uh, or 250, since, uh, since Blake, that claims, as William Blake put it, that, that Milton, is, Milton was of Satan's party, did not know it, that Satan really is the hero, this kind of Promethean anti-hero who, who dares to fight with God. Azrael is a figure like that. Um, neither orthodox, but not and a big romantic figure, but still not entirely trustworthy and certainly not um, morally reliable. His dark materials are the he in that his dark materials is God, that God might use chaos as his dark materials to create more worlds. There's the multiple world hypothesis right there hidden in Paradise Lost, Milton is much more than Shakespeare, an important forefather or kind of ancestor figure who is useful for science fiction writers. 
<coughs> pardon me, who's useful to me in a way that who's useful to who is useful to science fiction writers more even than Shakespeare is. What does this all have to do with Pullman and Lewis? Part of the gist of Paradise Lost is that the fall of man from the Garden of Eden, the loss of innocence, which is blamed on Eve, not just by Milton, but by a long tradition before him, the loss of innocence into a world of moral ambiguity where you have to make moral choices is positioned by Milton as a good thing. It is what the uh, medieval theologians called the Felix culpa, Felix culpa, happy crime, happy fall. Only if we fell from Eden, only if we entered a world of evil, sin, death, pain, misery, pandemics, what have you, can we actually morally grow and better ourselves. Milton presents uh, Adam and Eve in the garden as perfectly nice, perfectly heroic, but very static. They're just, they just live in a garden and eat fruit. That's what they do. And they never do anything bad because they don't make any choices. They don't know the difference between good and evil. They just don't sin because it doesn't occur to them. Being able to sin for Milton leads to the ability to make moral choices. You can choose you, until you know evil, you cannot choose good. Moral growth is only possible if you can fail. Welcome to free will. Milton is very, very committed to this idea. C.S. Lewis, kind of shockingly, for someone who's both a professional Milton scholar and a professed Christian, seems to think it would have been better if we didn't fail. He knows the Felix Culpa idea. He's, he's, uh, he's a Renaissance scholar he, and he's a, and a, and a medieval scholar. He knows all of this. His Perelandra, P-E-R-E-L-A-N-D-R-A, -E -E replays Eve's temptation with our human, uh, our Earthman narrator trying to intervene. So this time on another planet, it's a replay of Eve, Adam and Eve, and this time the Eve figure doesn't take it. Wouldn't it be better if she didn't eat the fruit? The answer, uh, according to Milton, is uh, no, it would not be better. Lewis has a simplified version of Christianity. And I want to say here, I'm not making a pro or anti-Christian statement. I want to point out to you that Christianity is a number of different beliefs. There are multiple versions of Christianity certainly very evidently ever since the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. Lewis believes it would be better if we never fell. And when he's writing about children, this becomes important that you never, if you never progress to adulthood, never lose your innocence, you would be better. There's a prioritization of innocence over mature experience. Here is where Pullman is siding with Milton against Lewis and showing the very large gap between Milton and Lewis. Now, Pullman may not be a believing Orthodox Christian in any way. Milton, while unorthodox, was a deeply believing Christian. But Pullman is showing us the gap in basic moral orientation between these two famous Christian British writers. And the Narnia books, the children are the ones who get to go to Narnia. And the thing that can keep you out is like the thing that can bar you from returning to Narnia is, 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 is sexual maturity. Famously, infamously, notoriously, um, one of one of Lewis's Narnia heroes, Susan, loses the ability to get back to Narnia that her brothers and sisters have. She ceases to believe in Narnia because she is she's caught up in Mrs. Coulter's world. Invitations and lipsticks and parties. She's going out dating, and when she goes out to date. Narnia is barred from her. If that seems super misogynistic to you, you're not the first one who thought that. Here is Lyra, who is on the, who is a little too young for that, just under that age of maturity, who is innocent, who still had, whose daemon still changes uh, shape, which in Pullman is the kind of indicator that you are not yet an adult, who is prepubescent, who is considered innocent. I would point out it's crucial to this novel 
that Mrs. Coulter eventually understands that Lyra is, as in Lewis, a reprise of Eve, a second Eve, who is going to replay that moral choice, the possibility of failure. Mrs. Coulter's immediate instinct, like Lewis's, is to prevent that from happening again, to prevent the fall. If there is a second Eve, you've got to stop her. Not what Milton says, where it's like, okay, this is bad, but it leads to a greater, richer human experience. We are better off in the end having had this terrible experience, the fall, than we would have if we never fell. Mrs. Coulter wants to prevent the fall. She wants, she prioritizes innocence over experience, but what she proposes to do about that to prevent the fall shows you how morally adrift she really is.